So the first thing we want to do here for chapter eight is to understand extrapolation, and that's extrapolation on the x-axis, extrapolation. So let's take a look. Here we are trying to estimate people's heights. We have males and females in here, and we also have their weight to help explain their height. Now, if we had someone who was below our x-axis individuals, or way above, or even just a little above, this would be an example of extrapolation here. So extrapolation is when you make predictions with your model. This is our model right here, these lines. We have two models in here for this example. Uh, we have two lines, and if we go outside of the x space, which for the females is any point above here and any point below here, and this would be extrapolation because the model doesn't have data to understand. So oftentimes look to see where your last points are to be like, oh, I'm extrapolating beyond my data. So above 345 would be extrapolation right here because there's no data points above that. And I would be extrapolating to use this model to explain the height of a male who weighs more than 345. Now there are some instances where you might use extrapolation. People use extrapolation in time series because they're trying to predict how much they'll make next month. And you have to extrapolate because if you don't extrapolate, you'd be like, well, I predict five months ago I'd make this much money. You're like, well, it's pretty accurate, but we're not really learning anything. Extrapolation is often used for speculation in time series. And we make speculation and extrapolation sound like a bad thing at times, but it's not. Because if you're very good at predicting, then that's excellent. But you don't want to extrapolate too far. You would never predict your company's profit 100 years in the future. You could predict it maybe a year in the future or two years or five years. And then after that point, people are like, I don't know if I trust your 50-year plan for your company that you're just starting today. So it's extrapolating way too far. So be careful. Now, when we look at groups in residual plots or groups in data, um, we can fit two lines, two separate lines. Here we have males and females, classic groups in here in the data, and you'll see they each get their own line. So we could also do residual plots for each of them, and we'd see very different residual plots. So just looking at the residual plot here, this is not a horrible residual plot for the females. Not too horrible. There's the presence of some kind of large residuals, and we might have a little bit of plot thickening here and plot thinning there. Um, so kind of issues, we can look at the male's residual plot. And once again, we wanna see nothing in these residual plots. So let's go down and look at the male residual plot. And aside from these points in here, I'm actually gonna make this look good. I'm gonna cheat today. I'm gonna to go to uh, rows, hide and exclude and take those out and make this residual plot look a bit better. And I'm just wanting to show for this last part here, kind of your quintessential residual plot. This right here is a very good residual plot. It's not perfect, but uh, we'd be very happy to see something like this. And this is the only residual plot we really cover in Stat 201. There's other types, but we're just looking at how much we miss by. And you see the zero, shows you it's a residual plot. And yes, so right here, um, this is a pretty good residual plot. We like it. I can make it look super good. I don't, I don't want anyone to say, oh, there's plot thickening, there's plot thinning. Um, going right here now, this is awesome. This is about, and if you were looking for a good residual plot, this is the one. So knowing what to look for can often tell you well, we don't want to see. We don't want to see any patterns. There's no real pattern to this. This just looks like somebody, you know, threw paint against the wall, just splattered everywhere, and there it just just didn't go in a pattern. Just nice and even. So there's nothing too extreme right here. We like it. So if you see something that jumps out to you, if there's an outlier, if there's a bend, we don't want to see those in residual plots. Once again, correlation is not causation. Very important to highlight that again. If you're seeing that line predicts really well, it doesn't mean that anything is causing anything. X does not cause Y. At least we don't know that. 
lurking variables and how they explain a correlation that is not due to causation. Sometimes there's a background variable. In the notes, we talk about TVs and how healthy people are because the more TVs you have, the healthier you are. But it's actually the lurking variable of um, access to doctors and wealth and healthcare of a country that's explaining that. And as you know, as a country has more access to wealth and doctors, they generally have more TVs and they generally live longer. Identifying outliers from a scatter plot, uh, anything that is an outlier in a scatter plot breaks the bivariate relationship. So we can go back and look at the data one more time and see up here if we have anything. These right here, these points are some pretty big bivariate outliers. These people down here are bivariate outliers. They don't follow the trend. So anything away from their line is going to be a bivariate outlier. And we don't usually include two lines on the test. This is just two separate scatter plots on top of each other with their own line. You'll see the lines have slightly different slopes because they go towards each other a little bit. Um, but there's a line for male and a line for females. And just showing you two groups of data points that would be better described by their own individual lines on one scatter plot. If you have questions, email me. Good luck. <laughs>